I'm going to be talking to Dr. Jim Stanford of the Center for Future Work about a study he's written uh, on the transition from workers out of the fossil fuel industry and uh, what uh, income and other support should be put in place and uh, what role government should play. So welcome to the interview, Jim. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad to join you. Now, why don't you give us a brief overview of the study to start? Sure. Uh, we did a, an overview, first of all, of the dimensions of fossil fuel employment in Canada. Uh, how many people work in fossil fuel industries? Uh, how has that changed in recent years? How are the jobs distributed regionally? Uh, and uh, so this, uh, this way, we're getting a sense of what is the scale of the problem we're dealing with. Uh, it turns out that uh, a little bit under 1% of total employment in Canada is in direct fossil fuel industries, uh, oil, petroleum, coal, and related functions. Uh, so that's less than a lot of people would normally think. Uh, secondly, it's already been declining uh, quite rapidly. Uh, we have seen the loss of about 50,000 fossil fuel jobs since 2014, uh, largely because of disruptions in global markets for these products. Uh, so uh, in a way that confirms that this energy transition is already happening. This isn't an abstract issue in the future. We're seeing it right now. In fact, fossil fuel jobs are already disappearing at a pace consistent with the complete phase out of fossil fuel jobs in, in a 20 year period, say. Uh, we also identified the regional distribution. Of course, we know fossil fuel jobs are not evenly distributed across the country. Uh, if they were, phasing out under 1% of total employment over say a 20 year period would be a non-event. Uh, but because fossil fuel uh, jobs are concentrated in uh, particular regions, uh, Alberta in particular, and uh, some communities uh, very dependent on them, that makes it a harder challenge uh, in terms of making sure this happens fairly and effectively. So uh, <clears throat> then we uh, show what would be like over a 20 year period if you had a gradual planned, managed, supported phase out of fossil fuel work, uh, instead of just waiting for a day of reckoning when the industry collapses, uh, we've already seen a little bit of what that looks like and it's not nice. Um, we would do it gradually over a 20 year period most of the transition effort, if you like, would be taken up through uh, retirement of fossil fuel workers. Uh, they are older on average than the typical Canadian worker. Most fossil fuel workers today are going to retire within the next 20 years. So uh, if you plan it, uh, that can do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, the number of jobs left that would have to be transitioned uh, literally from one job to another, say, um, uh, is quite modest, around 4,000 jobs a year over a 20 year period. And then we propose a number of best practices to support that through retraining, um, relocation assistance, early retirement incentives, income um, insurance programs, uh, and other measures. So we think that it could happen without a single person being involuntarily laid off uh, if we get ahead of the curve and support this transition rather than trying to deny and delay the inevitable. Now, Jim, uh, Energy Media has taken the position editorially that the as the energy transition advances, because there's no question that electricity is going to replace uh, oil and uh, uh, hydrogen to some extent uh, will as well. But we've argued that the industry should transition into making uh, feedstock for material production in manufacturing in the case of bitumen and natural gas being turned into hydrogen and that would preserve a lot of the jobs that you're talking about and create new employment uh, in the manufacturing side of this, of, of the industry. Uh, but I, you didn't address that issue in your, your study. Did you consider it at all? Well, um, Markham, I'm a labor economist, frankly, not an environmental scientist. So, uh, you know, I just kind of used a benchmark. I said that Fossil fuels are going to disappear in most applications over the next 20 years. There are still some things that we're going to use fossil fuels for. And our goal uh, is to get to net zero uh, by 2050. That's the timeline that most countries, including Canada, are adopting, which means there's room for a little bit uh, of fossil fuel related greenhouse pollution. So, um, frankly, you know, I didn't take a stand on that. Uh, I know enough, however, uh, about the economics of this uh, and the environmental aspects of it. Uh, that most of what we use fossil fuels for today won't be there. So, you know, there may be at the margins, uh, some continued use for bitumen as a input to, you know, modern materials and that kind of thing. Uh, hydrogen based on natural gas, I'm very skeptical of because there's still a lot of issues around the emissions from the natural gas production and 
if we're going to go to hydrogen, we might as well go to green hydrogen. And there's lots of new technologies for how that would happen. So uh, I, I think your point could be valid uh, at the margins. There'll be a little bit of work uh, left uh, there. There'll also be some work left in um, cleanup and amelioration of fossil fuel production sites, including orphan wells, uh, cleaning up, obviously, mines, coal mines, and bitumen mines, and so on. Uh, and that's another way to hire some of the existing fossil fuel workers for a few years to help with the cleanup. And in many cases, that will bridge them to retirement. So uh, there's a lot of moving parts in this. It's not a question of saying all of a sudden, this huge industry is going to disappear overnight, and we're going to turn out the lights. That's not how it's going to happen. And it's not how it should happen. And there's lots of options for how people can be supported to the adjustments, especially if we give them time. Time is the best friend of transitions. And, and we, we, if we do this right, we can, we can take the time to do it right. Now, I want to ask you about some of the support for workers because uh, we interviewed uh, Lance Mortlock from Ernst & Young a few weeks ago about his study that showed by 2040, 30% uh, of oil and gas workers uh, in Canada, uh, their jobs would be lost to automation and artificial intelligence, other new digital technologies. That trend is already well underway in the oil patch. I also interviewed uh, Dr. Dave Shook, who works in automation. He said that could happen by 2025. So some of these parts are moving a whole lot, you know, much more quickly than other parts. And does that play a role in the kind of incentives, this uh, transition strategy that you would advise industry and government to put in place? Oh, quite right. I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Markham. It's interesting to note that uh, fossil fuel jobs today, in a way, are under threat from all kinds of directions. It's not just about climate policy. Climate is important, of course, because the rest of the world is going to stop using our fossil fuels. That is clear. It's already happening. But there's other things happening as well, including uh, the automation that you mentioned. And I always laugh. I don't know whether to laugh or cry, frankly, when I see a CEO of an energy company stand up and pound their chest and say, I'm the best friend of the workers and we have to defend these jobs. And that's why we're opposed to a carbon tax, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they turn around and replace a good chunk of their workers with machines because they're cheaper. And that is happening all over the oil patch, uh, including automated uh, uh, machinery and equipment, automated drill technologies. Uh, and so on. So uh, similarly, a lot of downward pressure on wages and working conditions, health and safety uh, uh, conditions uh, in the industry uh, as well. So these jobs are under threat in a, in a general sense, not just because of climate policy. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, so I think that there's a, a whole portfolio of measures that can be invoked to uh, support these workers and, their, and the communities where they live in. Early retirement uh, is a big one. Um, planned downsizing rather than waiting for everything to shut at one moment, shut things down gradually over several years. And then you, if you've allowed for mobility across locations within the industry, then younger people who aren't near retirement yet can move from one location to another as they're gradually phased out. And the senior people can retire, uh, perhaps with incentives uh, at any location across the industry. Um, I mentioned relocation assistance for people, you know, maybe people move to Fort McMurray for an oil job. They would like to move somewhere else now. I'm not saying they have to. Fort McMurray's uh, got lots going for it and it will continue to exist after the fossil fuel transition, but some are going to want to leave. So let's facilitate that. Uh, let's facilitate uh, people to take other jobs, even if they don't pay quite as much as they made in the oil patch with an income insurance program. That's been tried successfully uh, in other countries where their wages would be topped up for a period of some years after making the, the transition that, um, you know, that will encourage them, I think, to start adapting a whole suite of measures. Uh, the key thing is that we have to recognize this is happening, bring all the players to the table uh, and uh, give them both the notice and the support to make the adjustments that can make this feasible. Now, you are a labor economist, and, and I know you used to work for the Canadian Auto Workers Union, if I remember correctly. Uh, what role do you think that unions should uh, play in this transition strategy? I mean, especially in Alberta, unions these days are, are not welcomed with open arms anywhere by the, the government in particular. Um, I think unions uh, are an absolute critical player in this process. And uh, my former union, uh, which now is called Unifor, actually represents a lot of workers in the fossil fuel industry. And, um, and I think like most other Canadian unions has been pretty uh, forward thinking about what this whole thing means and has been arguing for 
a just transition act at the federal level and various types of supports and uh, incentives uh, uh, in, in each of the industries or sub industries where their members work. Um, yeah, I think it's critical that workers have their own seat at the table and their own voice uh, in negotiating the sorts of transitions that come along because the, the employers and you know, politicians like Jason Kenney, you know, they're gonna tilt at windmills and, and you know, again, uh, proselytize about how much they love fossil fuel workers, but they'll throw the workers under the bus uh, if they see uh, a profit enhancing opportunity to do so. And that's why workers uh, have to have an organized collective voice and a union is, is how to do that. So uh, unions should absolutely be a full player in negotiating the terms of these transition programs. We have some experience with that, frankly, the, uh, the transition of uh, coal fired electricity plants first in Ontario, then in Alberta, then in other uh, jurisdictions, it'll be gone uh, from Canada within a handful of years. Uh, those transition packages were negotiated with the relevant unions and uh, have proven to be very successful. Uh, in fact, in Alberta now, the coal fired power is almost gone uh, several years ahead of the timetable. And the transition plan that was negotiated, including unions is, is part of what happened there. So um, I think we have to recognize this is an, a national priority. It shouldn't, Alberta shouldn't be left on its own to deal with this huge transition. Every Canadian has a stake in moving to a clean energy future as quickly and fairly as possible. And uh, the federal government and the provinces and all the other stakeholders uh, should absolutely be, be working together to deliver the, the notice, the policies and the supports that can do this fairly. Jim, thank you very much for this, really appreciate it. My pleasure, Mark, and thank you for having me.